you can start. Thank you, Ilse, for inviting me for, for the, thank you to the organizers for inviting me to, to give this closing, closing lecture. It's a pleasure for me. So, so it's been, it's been like a third of the fourth time that I've been invited to give a, a lecture on the future of something. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit suspicious, you know. I'm starting to think, what are the really skills that they are looking for on, on me? Okay, so I, I like starting just with a, a bit of a, a joke. So let's talk about the, the future of, uh, of BLBI. Um, I want to divide the talk in, in four parts. So first, uh, you've been learning this week uh, what to do with BLBI. So let's review that. So what we can get from BLBI right now and um, where we are heading to, what we will be able to achieve in the near or uh, near future. And the third part of my talk would be what would be the future of the BLBI in the SKJ era and the, all the science that the, the SKA BLBI capability will, will allow to, to end. So this is the first image of a review source that was ever produced. Uh, this is Thickness A, if you remember, it's very famous. And it, <laughs> it's quite good, actually. Uh, it was produced by Janison and uh, Dasgupta in the, in the 53 with the, one of the first uh, connected interferometers. But from this image to this state-of-the-art uh, image of the event horizon of the supermassive black hole, in M87. Uh, so actually 50 years have passed, you know, of uh, improving and advancing the calibration and the processing techniques. So what we are getting for from BLBI right now, so we are talking the stream angular resolutions that we can achieve uh, with radio astron, for instance, or EHT are about 10 to 30 microseconds. Dynamic ranges normally are 100 to 1. Uh, spatial dynamic range is 1,000 to 1. Um, dynamic range is the, 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 the most brightest thing compared to the, to, the less, to, to the most faintest thing that you can uh, get in a map and a spatial dynamic range is the smallest to the largest thing that you can uh, resolve and, or detect. So that's, that's what I'm talking about. So if we include uh, Emerlin baselines in the EVN, we are reaching right now 1,000 to 1 uh, spatial dynamic ranges. Uh, positional accuracies with absolute uh, astrometry, we are achieving 100 microseconds. With relative astrometry, when we are studying individual sources, uh, that goes down to 50 microseconds. And field of views, uh, historically, BLBA has been just limited to few seconds, few seconds, but now with the new techniques, we are able to, to image the full uh, beam uh, reaching tens of arc minutes. So plenty of signs have been addressed already in these 50 years, okay? Uh, this is just a sample, so everything about just yet physics, and we know lots about uh, relativistic jets nowadays and uh, transients uh, like the uh, latest uh, gravitational wave events and the counterparts were the FRBs uh, localizing them and very detailed uh, dynamic in the, in the galaxy and in the clusters and reference frames, celestial reference frames. But do we need more? And I'm hearing, I'm hearing like more, 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 more. Of course, of course we need more. So it's just been published a, a great document that um, uh, establishes the scientific roadmap of, for the next decade for the for the EBN network, and, and also for the for VLBI. And this is a jumping jive project, a, a European Union funded uh, project, uh, deliverable. And it establishes the role of the EVN, VLBI in the future, the astronomy, astronomy landscape. It is about 200 pages of science uh, divided in seven chapters. 80 authors have contributed. And it gives us the 
eight key science goals that the LBI would be able to, to contribute in the next decade. So, and these are the um, other uh, facilities would like to answer these questions as well. But uh, yeah, the LBI would be able to, to contribute. So what is the nature of dark matter, dark energy? How the first black holes were formed? Uh, how these relativistic jets form and how do they impact their host galaxies? What is the physics of the gravitational wave events? What are these fast radio bursts? And the one billion question, are we alone? How was the Milky Way form, born? And how do the, the stars are, are formed? And how do they uh, enrich the environment during their lifetimes? And the document also contains all the technical priorities that would be needed to, to achieve all these goals in the next decade. And synergies with other facilities, radioastronomy radio facilities, multi-wavelength, multi multi-messenger facilities. So, but how do we achieve these goals? How do we to get more? So I'm going to talk about these five uh, topics. Ultra precise relative astrometry, a stream angular resolutions that could achieve with the space VLBI, continue with the wide field imaging that we've been learning during the, this workshop. Imaging, let's, let's not forget, is going to be very important, the low frequencies, imaging at very low frequencies, and imaging with, of course, these more, 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 I was hearing in the background, with higher fidelity, higher sensitivity. So ultra precise astrometry. So BLBI is the technique that provides the highest accuracy and precision for the determination of positions, distances, motions. And the goal is to reach that these ultra precise astrometries to 10, better, 10, 10 times better than we are doing right now. So achieve uh, micro second resolutions, but not for individual sources, um, for large and complete surveys. So we will be able to achieve this with the next generation instruments like the SKA and NGBLA. So astrometric calibration uh, needs a special techniques to preserve the astrometry information. self calf destroys, get rid of that actually. So we, we need to use different, uh, different approaches to reach the, what we call the thermal limit, the interferometer thermal uh, uh, limit of the, of the interferometer that, um, so this, um, the error in the position um, is proportional to the size, to the, to the size of the resolution of our, of our, of our beam, the, the resolution of the interferometer divided by the signal to noise of the, of the observation. So, and as we've learned also during the workshop, this uh, relative astrometry techniques uh, are very important for imaging faint and or extended targets. So I just want to review very fast uh, because we we haven't um, talked about this in the in the workshop, but yeah, maybe you've heard about it. Uh, what are the the phase calibration techniques? So these um, three are the, the standard ones that has been using for for decades. So the conventional phase referencing is using observing your target and observing a, a reference source, a calibrator, and switching very fast between both of them to correct for this uh, for the, for the phases for the for the um, the distortion of the phases that the atmosphere is in is introducing and, and other effects. If you are happy and you have a dual beam uh, system, you can observe simultaneously your reference and your, and your target as uh, what Vera does, the Vera interferometer. In lower frequencies that your, your beams are wider, the antenna primary beams are wider, and also the, the sky is more populated, you are lucky enough to be able to have the, your target and your reference source in, in, this, in the beam, and that's what is called in beam phase referencing. So when you use this uh, like observing modes uh, together with advanced astrometric calibration uh, methods, uh, like uh, inserting in your schedule geo blocks to correct for troposphere effects or ice blocks for the ionosphere, you get uh, precise relative astrometry. 
So what is the next generation of uh, astrometry, astrometric uh, calibration techniques? So um, uh, we have, for instance, short frequency phase referencing that is using, is observing uh, uh, in fast, fast uh, agility mode, in frequency agility mode, uh, different frequencies, and is transferring the phase uh, solutions from the lowest frequency to the highest. So that's allowing to do uh, astrometry, relative astrometry at millimeter wavelengths, and, and a rich coherent times, the order that there was impossible before, the order of hours at 130 gigahertz. That's, uh, that's outstanding. So these observations can be done simultaneously at the K KVN uh, network that we have the uh, quadrupole uh, receiver. Mm, you need to observe also in, in this case, uh, a reference source and switch between your target and the, and the reference to correct for the ionosphere. But also you could just, in, in the multi-frequency phase referencing, use just the source, your, your target, and include in your schedule ice blocks to correct for the ionosphere. And one of the latest techniques developed by Rio Han Dodson is the multi-view uh, technique that instead of using just one reference source, uses many around your target, uh, at least three, and, and cycles uh, around them. And, and well, that, that is, is a method that could be used uh, for both ranges, for low and high frequency ranges. And if you want to correct for planar effects, you just need three. But if you want to go to higher um, curvatures to correct for a higher order, you need to serve uh, more calibrators. So with these techniques, these just ne next generation techniques, uh, we've been able to achieve up to 10 microseconds for the high and low uh, frequency regimes with the uh, a dynamic range of uh, approximately 100 to 1. So with the next generation instruments, that is, the Rs improve by an order of magnitude, there are wider bandwidths, larger field of views, so the thermal limit would be, would be reached um, with much better precision, so uh, for higher, above 6 gigahertz, we'll be able to reach 1 microsecond uh, uh, accuracy in, in positions and enable precise astrometry for much lower frequencies. Okay, so as I said you before, VLBI is the technique that is providing the, the better angular resolutions in, in, astronom in astronomy nowadays. So why not exploding that till, till the limit? So there's been a study, a concept uh, for a space-borne uh, radio interferometer presented by Gurbitz et al to the ESA Voyage, Voyage uh, 2050 uh, call. And it would uh, exploit uh, ultra sharp angular resolution down to microseconds and sub microseconds. So it's orders of magnitude better that, uh, in, in resolution and dynamic range that we are uh, getting right now. So the, the, there would be a breakthrough uh, in, in the studies with this high resolution. So it would be, We'll be able to, to emit the event horizons of supermassive black holes that are farther away from M87, a bit smaller, maybe. Um, study the physics of the, where the jets, the relativistic jets, are being actually launched, going down to parsec scales, and study binary uh, AGNs, uh, time and X ray domain synergies, mega masers in other, in other galaxies, protoplanetary disks of planets, and SETI, why not the the techno signatures. So in the topic of wide field uh, VLBI imaging, um, thanks to these uh, advancing techniques, the VLBI has become a survey instrument. So before we, we were just focusing on, on single sources and but now we, we are able to do surveys. So the fields of view have improved to up to the tens of uh, our minutes. And if you have fields that are larger, you use mosaic as uh, Jack Radcliffe was telling us uh, yesterday with the BLBA Cosmos. So um, this, been, this has been thanks to the software correlators, to the advancing software correlators. We are not limited anymore in a spectral, in spectral and temporal resolution. And so, 
and also the, these software correlations are allowing us to have many different phase centers, not just not just one. So this has allowed to to map the whole uh, primary beam of of our antennas. And as Jack was telling us the, the other day as well, uh, these two uh, projects, VLA Cosmos and Goods Northfield, uh, are using this uh, advanced calibration technique that is the, called the multi-source self-calibration that allow us to, uh, together with the primary beam corrections, allow us to, to reach the micro Jansky regime in this surface. This has direct application to multi-beam telescopes that I'm so much interested in because we could uh, uh, point these beams to different uh, phase, uh, phase centers to target uh, the sources, this, so target all these sources that have been detected. And, and also we will be able to, to do it with the large single D antennas with the phased array fits installed at the, that enlarge uh, their, their field of views. And also has a direct application on the determination of the uh, direction dependent uh, calibration. As Jack was telling us, this is a field that, that is being developed just as, as we speak. So, but apart, apart for, from multi-source uh, uh, self-calibration, there are other uh, techniques, there are other algorithms. So for instance, if when you have a very complex and extended structure in your in your field, so it's, it is not uh, so easy to to map that field with with just delta functions. So multi-scale cleaning is has added also Gaussian functions that to improve to improve these uh, these models. There are other. Uh, algorithms like compressed sensing that produce very accurate models that could use for the EHD, for instance. And when you have large field of views, um, your plane of the sky is not um, plane and is not a plane anymore. It has a curvature, and your Earth is has a curvature. So you cannot assume that you are you cannot play with planes anymore. So you need the, to correct for the W term, what is called the W term. So this algorithm W projection uh, is taking care of that. Also how the PSF changes over the, the large field of view, the large image. Very important for projects like uh, Christiana Spingola was telling us the other day that they have a very extended um, complex and diffuse structure. So when you when you when you try to de to define your 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 cleaning window, your mask is quite difficult. So there are algorithms that uh, to help you do that automatically, automatic scale dependent masking. So that's been applied in in Christiana's uh, project, the uh, SAR program. Other algorithms to take into account the spectral variation, the multi frequency deconvolution. Or when you have a so large field of view, uh, you need a special algorithms to do the grading of the um, of the images and of the visibilities, and um, so that's done that could be done, for instance, with image domain grading uh, that takes care also of the variation dependent effects. And I don't know, also parallel cleaning, so you can be divide your your field of views in a small images and, and clean in parallel. So most of these routines have been included in, in the Darius clean of the uh, offering a, a, a package. And for instance, has been used by Tom Muxlow in his Emerge uh, and et al, in, his, in their Emerge survey. And, and he uses the W stacking for the Merlin large field of view. Okay, imaging at very low frequencies. So um, historically, uh, VLBI has been focused on centimeter uh, wavelengths, but LOFAR has opened the, the range of, of lower frequencies. So, and, and, and in those frequencies, the direction dependent effects are very important, the ones that are caused by the, by the ionosphere. So they affect not only the position, it shifts the position of the sources, but also there's a defocusing in the, in the, in the brightness. So Rioja and Dobson have developed 
uh, a calibration algorithm called LIP for MWA that corrects for this uh, for these two for these two effects, the seeds and the, the focusing. It's a real time uh, phase calibration that, that is done in the visibility domain. Uh, it's done in real time because it doesn't need an sky in a sky model. Um, it uses the frequency smearing as a very effective directional filter. It will be directly applicable to SKJ1 low when they when they beam form to uh, to create the tight array beams for pulsar timing for observations of pulsars or for BLBI. So it will be very relevant for, for SK1 low. If you use LIP in conjunction with WSCLEAN, you are able to get wide field of views with direction dependent effects corrected. Okay, but there are other, uh, other solutions for DDEs, like uh, the one that is using low far, low far facet uh, calibration, and that divides the, in the field in, in a small facets where the direction dependent effects are considered constant, or uh, more uh, modern, uh, this model by Albert that, is a that uses a probabilistic model for inferring these uh, ionospheric phase screens. So these this, uh, calibration techniques have been used for the LOTS uh, low far uh, survey. And here I wanted to, to show you the, um, the record for highest uh, spatial resolution at, uh, at 55 megahertz that has been achieved uh, by Limora Vito uh, using uh, standard BLBI calibration techniques. Okay, and to finish this uh, second part, uh, let's see how we could improve the fidelity and sensitivity of our maps. And that's completely related with the technical enhancements that we are going to, um, that we will need in this next decade. So we will need broadband receivers uh, that cover at least from, from C band to X band to improve sensitivity, instantaneous coverage, and, and also improve the efficiency in the observation so we don't have to serve for so long. And it would require that these new receivers have a good polarization response. So for instance, brand EVM would, would be one of those, one of these receivers. We would need to increase the data rates. Uh, we, for instance, in DBM, we are using two gigabit per second right now, so we increase by four. So we will, we will need solutions to handle data storage, connectivity, and, and do that correlation. And we would be interested on, on extending the frequency coverage to higher and lower frequencies and increase the number of antennas that, that are able to serve in, at these frequencies. Also, to improve the, fi the fidelity, we need to improve the UV coverage. So we need more antennas in the networks especially towards the southern uh, hemisphere to, for SKA synergies in the, in the future. So, and I will tell you a little bit more on, on this in a, in a second. Also, extend the field of view. So we want really, if we want to do surveys, so we want to, to, to have even wider field of views. So installing paths in the larger, in the larger antennas. In this way, we will be able to align, to align the surveys that we will do with BLBI with the surveys that will be done in other astro astronomical facilities. And all of these would, um, would need an enhancement of the software correlators to cope with these uh, upgrades, with more telescopes, with telescopes with multiple beams, with new serving modes, etc. So on the, um, on the UV coverage, so this is a sample of the EVN, of course, um, it's been, it's, it's been a, a great uh, achievement that uh, we've been able to include the e Merlin baselines in the, in the EVN correlation. So that has improved uh, tremendously the, sp the sp spatial dynamic range. So, but with many times the BLA sensitivity. So when you go to global BLBI, BLBI and use a multi-frequency synthesis, basically you coverage the, the whole UV plane. Okay, so there's, um, there are efforts to, to, to establish a global BLBI alliance 
to, to promote, to, to have a truly uh, collaboration, global collaboration for BLDI in, in the world, and that to promote that. And, and that uh, alliance has started to, to improve the, the, the increase in the number of antennas that, uh, that will participate in, in the network. So there I've added um, the potential collaborations that we may have in, in a near future we've already had. So, so as you can see, uh, BLBI is, is really improving. And this is the example of the African BLBI network. And there's the, there's the idea to refurbish all these uh, communications, uh, telecommunications antennas. Uh, one of them, Ghana, this one has already been refurbished and is being used as a, as a radio telescope. So for the African BLBI network, um, we could follow this path or there are other, there could be other solutions. Um, so, well, there's, there's a study by Sarao, uh, we call the uh, collocation program that is studying how to uh, support um, this development together with development of the, of the local industry. So to collocate uh, not only the science, to collocate industry together with the science uh, sites. Okay, so and, and as, as you can see, the UV coverage uh, with the like the um, uh, midterm uh, AVN uh, would improve a lot, and with the full AVN would be would be fantastic towards the, the southern hemisphere for future synergies with the SKJ array. But meanwhile. Uh, when we when we do global BLBI with uh, the long baseline array in Australia, EBN is Asian BLBI network and ABN just Ghana, and and if we could include Mirkat, so we get quite reasonable UV coverage in at, at, at most of the declinations. Okay, and I just wanted to do a parenthesis here and talk a, a little bit about the sustainable development. Uh, because all this development is, is very nice, but needs to be done in a sustainable way. And the United Nations uh, in the General Assembly last month has recognized that and has uh, set these 17 goals for sustainable development for the, for the incoming years. And so first I was like, oh my goodness, so when, what I'm going to do how I'm going to do BLBI sustainably. <laughs> so do I have to take my bag? <laughs> okay, just okay. So the SKA and the precursors that are uh, that have already uh, the precursors uh, develop and, and build the precursors on the on the future SKA sites are already taking into account this uh, United Nations uh, sustainable development goals for the African BLBI network. The data program that is development of Africa with radio astronomy is also uh, based on these on these goals, and, and let's not forget that the BLBI is a international collaboration. It always has been. It cannot work without it. It's truly an international collaboration, and different cultures, diversity is just in our veins. Okay, so this is the third part of my talk that I'm going to talk about the future of BLBI in the SKA era. So why we, we would do BLBI with the SKA? So this is a plot by Jack Radcliffe that I like very much that shows the angular resolution of the different connector like BLA, a connector interferometer, but also in the different configurations, but also all the BLBI networks and global BLBI, and where are the different niches in, in angular resolution. So SKA is going to change dramatically this picture because it's going to cover all of the angular resolutions, okay? But till we get the full realization of the SKA, SKA2, so BLBI is going to provide, is still going to provide the highest angular resolutions, 
to the high priority uh, objectives of the, of the SKA. So it's going to allow us to do a ready with SKA one mid, in this example, uh, SKA two science. So yeah, so why a little bit more on why we want to do uh, the LBI with SKA. So as you know, the SKA is going to have, uh, is one observatory that is going to have two telescopes, one in South Africa, that is going to be in the phase one, about 200 antennas, in phase two, 3,000 something thousand of antennas, and SKA one low in Australia, that is a different type of antennas uh, sensitive to lo the lower frequencies and dipoles. So first phase is going to be like 100, uh, 130,000 antennas, uh, the full phase is four times more, something like that. So why we want to, what, what scale will provide to, to us? So it will provide uh, independent and multi-beam capability from these uh, two telescopes. It will boost our sensitivity to the micro regime. Uh, it will allow us to access the southern skies on the galactic uh, center for longer times. And it will allow us also not only to do VLBI, but to observe in other modes, uh, in other of their observing modes simultaneously. And it will provide um, a superior amplitude and precision calibration. And it, these two telescopes are located in a pristine RF environment. And, and also the, the telescope will use state-of-the-art RFI detection and excision algorithms. So what we would provide them? So images on the sky, a broad range of angular resolutions, as I told you before, milliard second resolutions for high priority objectives, for the high priority science, independent commissioning tools. This is very important to help them to understand how their, their system works and early uh, public relation opportunities. And of course, and I think this is the best, is an enthusiastic and an expert user community. Okay, so realizing about this importance, the Jumping Jive project that is uh, funded by the European Union, uh, the World, World Package 10, is, uh, is, is, is providing support for the SKA integration and operations within the VLBI networks. It's led by Sol Paragi, yeah, Jive and Antonio Crisostomo in the SKA office, and I'm the SKA uh, pro, uh, VLBI project scientist. Uh, I was working in the SKA office for two years, and now I'm, I'm working for Jive till the end of the project in July. It has been extended. So how we do how we do VLBI with the with the SKA? So the SKA will provide these multiple beams. Uh, typically from the core, so we will phase up the core to produce multiple beams, up to four or maybe even more. Uh, but also, uh, we will be interested in using individual SKA antennas or stations to cover the short UV spacings, as exactly the same as the EVN is right now using within Merlin. The SKA would be able to define these uh, different subarrays with different number of antennas and, and, uses, and use them independently for different purposes. So for instance, for us, if we wanted to serve two uh, frequencies like L-band, band two, that is going to be SKA, and band five, that is uh, C-band. So we would be able to uh, divide the core of the SKA in two and get two subarrays producing these multiple beams in these two different frequency bands. Within each subarray, we will be able to get all the, the, the observing modes simultaneously. So you get the imaging from SKA, continuous spectral line, and also uh, imaging for slow transients, and non-imaging. So transient and pulsar search beams, uh, pulsar timing beams, in case, in case you're observing a pulsar and you want to, to measure very accurately the, the arrival of the position of the signal of the pulsar, and transient buffer uh, for, for, for transients, and, and also PLPI beams, all these together for each subarray simultaneously. And also, these beams within each subarray will be able to be controlled independently. 
So point different points in the sky, but also control them differently in scan boundaries. So the support uh, to the SKA project um, with with um, with foresee that it would be done by, by an SKA BLBA consortium that it would be uh, formed by the main uh, BLBA networks and institutions, research institutions that are interested, and observatories that are also interested in, with, uh, in observing with SKA. Okay, so more in detail how, how SKA is going to, to, to collaborate in BLBI observations with SKA1 MEET. So they will be able to provide, as I told you, all these observing modes within each subarray simultaneously, but with a bandwidth sacrifice. We won't, we won't be able to get the, if we want to get different observing modes, we won't be able to get the full bandwidth. And here in gray, you have all the details I'm not going to go through, but this is for your reference of the different things that we can get with SKA1 MEET. Uh, maybe more interesting for you is that we will be able to, to have different sizes of the core. So depending on the field of views you want to reach in this in these uh, BLBI beams or the sensitivity that you need, you will have to reach an agreement. Okay, so so lots of sensitivity. You get more antennas in your in your subarray in your core, a larger a larger diameter core, but also your your beam is going to be very 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 narrow. Okay, so you'll need to reach an agreement uh, for that in your observations. So the so for proposal preparation, we will have templates to help to guide you with, with this. And on the, on the right, you have the system equivalent flux density that you would expect with these uh, different configurations, with dif these different diameters of the core. And on the bottom, the um, a baseline sensitivity that you would arrive, that you would get with a one minute integration, assuming a 100 meter class telescope on, on the other side. And this is just to show you that um, you, you will be able to get all these observing modes simultaneously um, in most of the bands because the bandwidth is, is quite limited. So band one, band two is just about one gigahertz bandwidth. So the, the processing resources are quite enough for that. But when you go to band, band five, um, there are no, there are just sufficient processing resources to process full bandwidth with just one processing mode, okay? So you are able to get uh, BLBI beams two or four with five and 2.5 gigahertz uh, bandwidth, but none of the other modes simultaneously. And if SKA is doing full imaging, full bandwidth imaging, there won't be resources for, for, for any other serving mode. Okay, with low, we won't have that limitation because the, the bandwidth is very, is very small, it's just 100 megahertz, so all the serving modes will be, be able to be provided per subarray. So there's no problem at all with that. And also just check uh, the gray window for the details. Okay, in this case, um, the array would be limited on the on the size of the of the core that will be able to 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 face up up to ten kilometers uh, radius. That would be the maximum of the size of of the core to face. And and there you can see the on the top you have the, the system equivalent flux flux density for these configurations and the. Um, what the, the baseline sensitivity you would achieve with, uh, again, one minute integration and 100 meter class, I've, I've seen 100 meter class on the other side for low frequencies, okay. So you will be able to achieve hundreds of micro Janskis in one minute. For, for me, it was tens of micro Janskis in one minute. Okay, and now uh, just a short uh, note on how the, the SKA Observatory would work because it can influence the, the VLBI 
uh, way, the, the way that we do ELBI and we are used to do things. So um, the ESK Observatory is going to produce per year 300 petabytes per year per telescope, so a total of 600 petabytes and an estimate of 250 petaflops, okay? So and the image cubes uh, are the visibility, the visibility sets are the order of 10 to 100 terabytes. So that's not possible to, to be able to provide to the, uh, to the users, to the scientists. So, so you will get the, the, the SKA science ready products. So uh, the SKA image cubes are ready that in any way will have terabytes of, uh, of size and two to the 16 frequency channels. So they will be also quite, quite uh, large. But you, you won't forget your visibility, so, so you, won't, you won't get them anymore. So um, the way that SKA would work, it will have a, a tier model for uh, regional centers. It will have a, this distributed uh, network of a regional center that it will have like a subset of the SKJ archive and um, with processing and post-processing capabilities for the user to be able to, to, to access. Um, and they will be responsible for distribution of the data to the users and to give user support. And the idea is that they, they follow the open science model. So to, to change the culture of, um, of radio astronomers, on, on, on the data, on not having these visibilities anymore. That's why the SKA project has uh, launched the SKA data challenges to change the culture on post-processing and analysing of the radio astronomy data. And also is going to pose uh, a change into the, into the BLBI world as well. So I just wanted to tell you a bit of these uh, data challenges that the SKA is doing. So the data uh, has different layers. So from the correlator, we, we get the raw data. Uh, SDP, the science data processor, uh, provides the products calibrated and this, the SKA regional centers provide the advanced, uh, the advanced products that the key science projects uh, use to to produce the scientific results. So there are different uh, stages where you can do uh, the data challenges. And the first one would be at the SDP level, what is called the SDP, the risking a big data challenges using 10 to 100 terabytes of, of data. But the SKA project has started with what they call the science uh, uh, data challenges with, uh, with the data sets of the order of terabytes they are um, letting the scientists play with these uh, science-ready products that the SKA will produce. And they've already uh, started with, uh, they've done already one uh, data challenge that it was a, a continuum image. Uh, I had 10 million sources, 32K by 32K pixels, four gigabyte size. It was three frequencies, three depths, eight hours, 100 hours, 1000 hours. And the goal was to find efficient methods to, for, for, for source finding and characterization and classification. So um, this was very successful exercise. Uh, nine groups participate, participated and Anna Bonaldi has uh, recently published the, the results. And they've just launched the second uh, data challenge. But you are, if you are interested, you are still on time to to express your interest. And it's a um, um, neutral hydrogen image product that is the order of a terabyte, 20 uh, degree square uh, in size, uh, covering that, uh, that red sieve. And it will contain, this is a bit of a spoiler, I shouldn't tell you because maybe you want to participate into the six H1 galaxies and to the seven uh, continue sources. So about 30 teams have already expressed their interest. And of course, for analyzing that, they will need resources, HPC, high processing computing resources. So um, some agreements have been already in place for them to be able to use several 
different uh, facilities. So if you are interested, go to the SKJ webpage to register your, your interest. Okay, for, S for BLBI, for BLBI, we are also interested on in doing uh, data challenges. So there are like two different um, paths for the data. So um, SKJ will produce um, visibilities from the BLBI observations. And from these uh, visibilities, the SDP will produce images. And this, this, the SKJ regional centers will provide us with advanced imaging products. We are foreseeing this for, for, for calibration, for instance, because the, the, reason, the if we observe a calibrator, it won't be resolved out in the SKJ images, so it would, could help tremendously in the data reduction for BLBI. So the other data path is they will also provide the SKJ BLBI beams that together with the other BLBI stations will be sent to the BLBI correlator to correlate all these together and these raw visibilities, well, where they will provide it for, to the scientists, to the key science uh, teams, and that will provide, that they will produce um, a, a product and, and analyze it and, and publish results. So the SKJ advanced imaging products will, will help to reduce post process these uh, raw visibilities. So we are thinking on um, exercising uh, data challenge on this stage, what is called one, and on this, the second stage, number two. Okay, and now to finish with my, with my talk, this is the, the last part that I want to, to tell you. So uh, including SKJ in the BLBI networks, in the BLBI observations, what science I will be able to do. So all this was discussed in, uh, last year, sadly, um, a year ago, in the uh, in the SKJ headquarters in Jotel Bank, where around seventy scientists gathered together uh, to discuss what what is the key science uh, themes that we'll be able to solve with this uh, with this capability. Uh, this workshop was supported by Jumping Jai, by the SKJ and RadioNet, and and also I wanted to mentioned you that the, the SKA has the SKA BLBI science working group that you could, if you are interested, you could join the efforts. And the chairs right now are Tao An and Cormac Reynos and previously was Sol Paraji. So during the workshop, we divided in, in four working groups, uh, divided in different science topics, uh, AGNs, star astrometry, transients and um, pulsars, and these groups were led by these, by these colleagues. And they've established, each group established their key, key science themes for, for each of these uh, topics. So for the galaxies and AGNs group uh, determined that the key science uh, themes are going to be the separation between AGN and star formation, uh, supermassive black hole evolution, the feedback and fueling of the IGNs in the host galaxies, or the physics of the uh, relativistic jets, uh, studies of dark matter with uh, gravitational lenses, and black hole and black holes and cosmology. In this uh, in this topic, it was highlighted the importance that SKJ low BLBI will have with the high resolution sensitivity and the low frequencies, because the low frequencies uh, for AGNs studies are um, a unique proof of, of, the, of the science. So uh, it helps uh, to disentangle between the AGN and star formation uh, activity. Uh, it helps characterize the FR1s versus FR2 populations. For radio loud uh, AGN, uh, you can do all the physics in the, of the hotspots with the spectral modeling. Um, for radio quiet, very interesting to, to know the origin of from where the radio emission comes and identify uh, the core, where's the core, if there's a core, and, and, and study these small scale uh, jets or, or winds and any gravitational lens uh, effect that you may have. And the goal would be to build a sample of uh, resolved high redshift uh, AGN, um, of course, in these frequencies. 
for centimeter uh, frequencies and higher frequencies that would be covered by SK1 meat and, and with BLBI. So you also be, get advantage of this high resolution sensitivity and the multiple beams. So we are interested in knowing how is the sky at these um, at these frequencies with below or better than Mikroyansky's sensitivities. And building on the deep deep, deep field surveys that the SKA is going to going to do target on the on, on, on a specific uh, target beams on a specific uh, uh, sources um, well that would, it would provide plenty of science to exploit like uh, feedback of supermassive black holes on their host galaxy also trace the mission um, for this uh, AGN again and star formation activity um, as you know VLBI is, is, is one of the best techniques to detect AGNs and also it would be very useful for supermassive black holes, binaries, gravitational lenses, radio supernovae, and low, low luminosity AGNs, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Okay, the second uh, group that it was stars and astrometry identified these uh, key science themes. So young stellar objects, stellar evolution in general, from young stars that you see to evolved stars, a dynamic of the clusters and local galaxies, global astrometry, explosion, novas, flares, so planets, stellar jets, etc. So in this uh, in this theme, in this topic, SKA VLBI would be the most powerful tool for, for astrometry. For and um, and with this, the new phase calibration techniques that I've told you before, for instance, multi view. Uh, we will be able to, to reach this one microsecond resolution for, for higher than six gigahertz. So with this ultimate astrometric uh, accuracy and then dramatic increase of, card, of number of targets uh, due to the increase of sensitivity, so we will be able to build this large, complete, uh, uh, large and complete surveys that will enable new discoveries. So just to mention uh, the uh, determine the orbits of the exoplanets, uh, uh, parallaxes, geometry parallaxes up to 100 kiloparsec, uh, pulsar parallaxes in the galactic center, methanol masers, the methanol masers in the in the large Magellan cloud, and study the launchings of the relative, relativistic jets. Okay, and to finish, the, the last two groups join together to define the key science themes. And they've determined that, of course, it's going to be the counterparts of the gravitational wave uh, events, uh, studies of FRBs, fast radio bursts, the subplanets, uh, try to detect more magnetars, studying pulsars, uh, gravitational uh, gamma ray bursts, uh, novis and supernovae, and tidal destruction events, and, and more. Yes. Five minutes. Good. Okay, just two or three uh, slides. So, SKA VLBI in this theme, in this topic, will 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 able to will be able to measure very accurately the source the source's expansion, the apparent uh, jet speed, proper motions, distances through the parallaxes. So, with that, uh, we will study the faint synchrotron radio transient local universe. So we will be able to um, resolve the ejecta within weeks and, and, and measure proper motions in the micro, micro second regime for gravitational uh, wave astronomy, astronomy, astronomy. We will resolve the relativistic outflows, FRBs, uh, localizations and study of the progenitor environments. So planets, again, to measure the orbital motions. Um, magnetars reach the galactic center and cover a larger uh, galactic volume for, for searchers. Okay. Okay, so as you can see, the, the BLBI future is, is bright and is sustainable. <laughs> um, but mostly the BLBI future will be built Thanks to you. And that's the, the end of my talk. 
I apologize if you cannot find your name in the slide. I, I, I did my best to, to try to recover all of them, but well, I couldn't. I know there are many names that are missing, but I just wanted to show that, the, that you are the key uh, part of this uh, game. Okay, um, also our sponsors, thank you to them. Um, and mostly thank you to you and thank you to the organizers for this splendid uh, workshop and for all the work that they've put on it. And if you are interested on this SKA uh, BLBI uh, effort, please drop me a line to that uh, to my email. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Christina. Uh, I really do like your crystal ball uh, image that uh, you will no doubt steal at some point. <laughs> so we, we've already got a, a few questions popping in and um, the, it, people have the opportunity to upvote questions or like questions if they've got a similar one. Uh, so we'll start from the top, which is a, a somewhat technical question. Uh, Ajit Sampath is asking, in the multi-view technique, which we can use for low frequencies, why should T cycle be five minutes? What if we are observing with a dipole array where the pointing where pointing the beam is stepwise and locating a cal calibrator, observing it and getting back to the target takes much time. How can we do astronomy, astrometry with that without using self-cal? So there's actually three questions in one. I hope you got all of them. Okay. Okay, so yeah, uh, he's right. These five minutes is just from an example that was the uh, exercise by Rioja and Dobson with the BLBA at like mid centimeter frequencies. So it's true that for lower frequencies that, that cycle would be uh, different. So he's correct on that. Uh, second question was, uh, what if we are observing with a dipole array where pointing the beam is stepwise and locating a calibrator, observing it and getting back to the target takes some time? How can we do astrometry with that? So, okay, oh. so if you got an array with multiple beams, phased array beams, in principle you, you are able to have all these beams simultaneously. So you won't, be, you won't need to to swap between your target and your reference. So you will have already these beams pointing simultaneously to these uh, two different directions. So, um, so it will help, help, help us tremendously. And the third question was? Yes, this, this was related to uh, if we have that set up, how do you do astrometry with that at, without using self-calibration? But I think you basically answered that if you have the beams pointing to different calibrators while you're observing your target, you basically know exactly where you're pointing and you should be able to maintain, to keep your uh, astrometric precision. Yes. Yeah. Okay, the next question is from uh, Gisela Ortiz. Um, that was rather at the start of your talk. Are these advanced calibration techniques, specifically the calibration from geodetic like blocks already implemented in CASA? I don't know. I think uh, that's something that you include, the geodetic blocks, you include them in your, maybe some of the panelists know, but it's something that you include in the, in the schedule. So, so you need some advice from people that knows how to how to do this, um, how to schedule these blocks. But um, it's just adding the blocks every, let's say every hour in your observing a schedule to, to correct for the tropospheric, in this case, the trop tropospheric effects or uh, the ice blocks for the ionosphere that I guess it would be. So um, it, it's just the um, blocks on certain reference sources. That, that you do uh, in certain frequencies also. So you have to define maybe different or certain frequencies for those blocks from, from your target program. Yes, so, so maybe does any of the other panelists want to comment on, on uh, CASA and Geodesy at this point?
It's very quiet. I'm, I must admit, I'm not entirely sure, but I do know that from the Jive side, the development for CASA is focused on the astron astronomy applications. And I, I've heard from several angles, there is more and more interest from the geodetic, geodetic community to start using the tools, but there is uh, uh, still some work to be done there. Yeah, uh, I, also, I, I can say that at least from major parallaxes, I know that most people that worked in the Bessel program, they used Mark Reed's, um, because you, you indeed you observe these, oops, yeah, these geodetic blocks as, uh, as Christina uh, explained. But then of course you want to derive um, additional corrections in, in, in delay and delay rate for each antenna. You want to derive the, the delays per antenna and then apply that. So to, to find those numbers, I don't think there is a routine in CASA that, that does this calculation for you. So we, ha we had a script in Fortran written by Mark. And I don't know if, if somebody has a plan to write code that into, into CASA. Hopefully, yes. Well, that is uh, that's definitely something to keep in mind that there is this interest and uh, it is something to also advertise and talk to uh, the NRO people about. Um, okay, I'll continue with the next question uh, from uh, Harald Verkouter. Did I understand correctly that a VLBI product, data product, will be simulated to be sent off for correlation and processing? So. I guess he's referring to the data challenges that you discussed. Okay, we haven't defined them yet, but yeah, uh, that could be one of the, although the, the simulation, well, the, the, the data challenge that we thought was after the VLBI correlator. So with the, the number one was using with the, using the visibility. So the product of the VLBI correlator but it's true that the, um, the BLBI will, correlator will be able to handle these multiple beams uh, telescopes. So it would be also very nice uh, exercise to, to simulate this, uh, these voltages. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I had a follow-up question on that actually, because uh, the, the simulations, the slide you showed indicated that you, you were simulating the SKA VLBI data products and there should then also be an additional simulation for the VLBI telescopes that are added to the SKA. Is, is that going to be part of the whole data challenge project or do we have to add the simulations ourselves somehow? So we, we haven't, we just uh, uh, brainstorm okay. on, on how they, this VLBI data, data challenges could be. And we've just uh, received uh, interest from when we discuss about it in this workshop we had last year so so scientists were very interested on 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 doing simulations and having these data challenges so yeah any idea you may have so as you can see it has not been advertised yet uh, this data challenge but yeah um, send me an email and, and we'll think uh, we'll think about it yes it sounds very interesting um okay so that was Harald's question. Then uh, at the top at the moment, there is a, a question from uh, Victor Pérez Díaz. Will those satellite constellations ruin field BI and radio astronomy? And how can we live together? Okay, so Starlink is already um, producing RFI in the regime from 10 to 14th gigahertz. So SKJ is getting quite worried about it. Um, because it would be the upper part of their band five. Um, and yeah, uh, that could completely ruin that, uh, that band. Um, and, and in the future, they, they want to, to go to higher frequencies, around 20 gigahertz or so. So, and that's a very important band for radio astronomy. So, so it's, uh, yeah, it's quite worrying because that's something that you cannot get rid of. Uh, you cannot avoid, they are all the time, there are so many thousands of satellites that they will be on view. And with this so extended arrays, they will be in, on view all the time. So it's quite difficult to, to get rid of their signal. So that's quite worrying. Yes, I know we had a launch presentation a few weeks ago from Walid Makur, who is the craft frequency manager and, and located at Jive. 
and he mentioned that there are discussions ongoing at, at very high levels on how to uh, manage this and ma make sure that at least for uh, for future uh, events there will be uh, less impact on astronomy but this is uh, definitely a, a big concern and it's on the agenda at several locations um, okay the next question oh this is a nice one uh, from Sumit is the SKA field VI going to be the extended EVN yeah, you can see the other way around that the SKA VLBI is going to be the standard SKA. <laughs> but not only the EVN, uh, LVA is also very well positioned to participate and collaborate with the SKA as I showed you in some of the UV plots, the UV coverage plots. So, um, and the East Asian VLBA network also is very well situated and is not only uh, the array that is going to be in South Africa is also low, SKA1 low, that is in, in Australia. So for that, it's, yeah, this Asian BLBA network would be uh, very well situated on the LBA as well. So, so yeah, I don't know who's, what is the, the first, the chicken or the egg? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a bit of a trick question uh, and, and, and politically potentially dangerous to answer this, but... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, uh, but it's, it's nice to see actually that I think what was clear from your talk is that there is more and more efforts to do field BI in, in a global organization and, and people are starting to talk to each other um, from, from many different countries to make this a true global effort. And, uh, and in that sense, I think uh, field BI is quite unique uh, in the scientific world that we do have that opportunity to join forces in non-political levels. Okay, there's one question left uh, also from Sumit, and this is a bit of a technical question, maybe also related to the, the previous discussions that we've had in the workshop. He's asking, I'm a little bit confused. Which one is more important while data processing, dynamic range or signal to noise ratio? Maybe it's silly to ask as we always check signal to noise ratio improvement after each self cal iteration. I don't think it is really silly to ask. I think it's, uh, it's a bit of an approach question. Do you want to answer this, Christina? Well, I know the sub subtlety between the difference between both of them. So dynamic range is the, the, the peak. It, it takes into account the, the peak in your in your image. The signal to noise ratio is is more with the like the mean, I would say, of the of the of, of the signal that you get on, on your source. Well, I'm not sure if I've explained it right but there are so subtleties between both of them. Um, so yeah, it's a very uh, technical question for, for uh, imagers and I'm not an, an imager. So I would be very <laughs> thankful if someone, some of the panelists could answer. Maybe, uh, Christiana, do you have an opinion on this? Very loud we, we can not really hear you very well, uh, Christiana. Uh, yeah, I have very bad connection here. Can you hear me? Yeah, this is better. Okay, so for the same reason I have moved the question and now it's not uh, anymore in the Q&A. Sorry, I didn't. Okay, I'll try to answer this in matter most as my connection oh, okay. is very unstable. Yes, fair enough. Um, yeah, I think Christina also got the main point across it. It's a matter of taste a little bit, but uh, there's somewhat different approaches. Any of the other panelists have a strong opinion on this that they would like to share? Probably not. It sounds very quiet. Okay, then uh, that, that was the last question in the Q&A. There was a, uh, a remark from, from Amy Kimball that the image of the biker was really hilarious. And, and I totally agree with that. And it, it, that's the bit of an awkward issue when you're giving a talk to a screen, you don't see how people respond to your jokes and it feels really, really silly. But I was glad to see that you tried to lighten things up a little bit with, uh, with some fun stuff. So I'm thinking, Christina, uh, sorry, Christina, thank you very, very much for, uh, for this presentation.